Fast asleep in my little house where I've lived for 50 long years. This is, of course, rather different from the way you saw it 10 years ago. Then I didn't have this wonderful sliding detecting gate, which I only wish I'd locked. And this door is, of course, brand new, because the last door was thumped in by 12 stab of vested police officers. That door and the CCTV unit cost me over £10,000 to replace. He don't touch vile pervert. Oh, stop now. Here, you get out of bed. Fucking queer. Get out of bed. He don't. He don't. He don't. He don't. Oh my God, what's going on? Twelve armed police officers in stab jackets raiding my bedroom are oh, dragging me naked out of bed. What am I going to do? Actually, they weren't too bad. They did appear at my private parts, but then who wouldn't? I'm also, sadly, rather older looking, not quite so young and handsome as I was in the year 2008. I was bundled into a car and driven down to Woking Police Station. The door replacing industry tells me it's a boom at the moment, something that that woman May, our new Prime Minister, really ought to do something about. Why are the police breaking down doors for no good reason on a daily basis? Theresa seems to have modelled herself on the child catcher. Ian Fleming's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I suppose it's better than the last one, who looked like a cross between a boiled egg and a back of a spoon. I don't want to say the line that all police are corrupt and bent, but neither do I want to take the other accepted line that most are absolutely fine and honest and honourable, and there's just a few bad apples. I think most are actually lazy bored, doing a job because they need the money, not morally concerned with any damage they may do, not bothered whether what they're doing is finding the truth or just getting a conviction, and essentially obeying orders from above so they can keep their job. That's what most police are currently doing. And I think that awful sickness, which means an infection has spread all the way through our police force, has led to a situation where police behaviour now in Great Britain is absolutely disgraceful. 
A young girl died in 1995. She was shot in the head. A few months before, a young soldier was also found mysteriously dead. In 2001, a boy shot twice in the brain. Surrey police said nothing odd. When in 2002, it happened again. Four dead kids in deep cut. The will of God? 2014, a worried mother rang Surrey police out of her mind. Her son was being groomed online. What should she do? They were polite and kind. Parents, friends, siblings did everything right. The police let his throat get cut one night. We need... be murdered. Met police found their killer in weeks. Incompetence, corruption, laziness. Nobody knows, nobody cares. If you think I'm a little bit biased against Surrey police, that's because they're the only force I've ever had to be involved with. My friend Paul Gambaccini, Gambo, hates the Met Police because of Operation U Tree. Uh, Lady Britain, Leon Britain's widow, hates the Met Police because of what they did to her husband. Uh, I think Lord Bramall hates the Met Police. Uh, as far as Wiltshire Police are concerned, David Bryant and his wife Lynn hate them, as I suspect do all the friends and family of Sir Edward Heath. Then there are all the other ones, like Jeff Long's local police force, Ched Evans's local police force, Hillsborough. I'm afraid, actually, it is the police in Great Britain that are generally loathed. As far as Surrey police are concerned, I'm absolutely sure if they'd done their job properly with the first deep cut murder, the other kid would never have died. If they'd done their job properly with Breck Bednar after his mother phoned them and asked for help, Breck would still be alive today. And if the officer in charge of my case, who managed to stitch me up because I did not commit the offences I was convicted of, but he was given the Millie Dowler case as a reward for his brilliant job on Jonathan King because he was meant to be an expert in paedophiles. Some expert, he didn't manage to capture Levi Belfield who went on to murder two other innocent girls, Amélie de la Grange and Marsha MacDonald, both fortunately in a different police force's jurisdiction. The Met Police and the inspector in charge of that, Colin Sutton, managed to track down and arrest Levi Belfield within weeks. He was later found guilty of the Millie Dowler murder and uh, the inspector in charge on behalf of Surrey, Brian Marjoram, uh, retired politely with a very large pension into a luxury home somewhere in the home counties. Back to me in Woking Police Station, where later on I discover my company bookkeeper Molly has also had her flat searched. Due to the mistaken, misguided and possibly illegal behaviour by Surrey Police, who wrongly considered it my second property. 
Molly in her 70s was extremely stressed and upset by several stab-jacketed cops removing all her Sound of Music videos and family photos. Luckily her son was able to come over and hold her hand. Likewise, I also gathered my friends Rob Randall and Dennis Corday had been raided and arrested. Rob, on the left in the 60s, had been a DJ at the Walton Hop, and Dennis, on the right, had owned and run it. My house was being torn apart, as were my cars, one described on the search warrant as a red Rolls Royce, when in fact it was silver. I wonder if being colour blind is sufficient excuse for police to commit a crime. I'm terribly sorry, Your Honour. I raided this car, broke into it and stole items from it with a search warrant for a red car where it was in fact silver. Which prison would you like me to serve time in, sir? No wonder my friend Cliff Richard is suing South Yorkshire police. There's another force. But I've got to say, I don't think civil actions are the way forward. I think it's criminal trials we need because so many police have crossed the line between uh, behaviour that's acceptable normally and illegal behaviour. Mainly, I suspect, conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. They actually encourage people to bear false witness and to lie in order to get convictions. The police in Britain today are not interested in the truth, neither are the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service. All they want is to get convictions and preferably high profile convictions. Anyway, there I am in Woking Police Station, being grilled by two particularly stupid lady officers asking the balmiest questions I've ever heard. My answers on the advice of my solicitor are no comment, because I'd never heard of either of the names of the two people making false allegations. That has subsequently changed. More of that in a moment. Back to Woking Police Station in Surrey. I do hope I'm not boring you to tears with this documentary. It's meant to be an entertaining movie, like Vile Pervert the Musical first time round was, which has had so far over two million views in the ten years it's been up online. It is, of course, free to watch online. It probably explains why so many people have. But that was the new way of getting things across. And I'm trying with this kind of documentary to make it thoroughly entertaining. So you watch it because you're getting a good laugh and you think it's good fun. And also you do like the music. It amuses me that Ooga Jaga, Ooga Ooga, which was featured on the soundtrack of Guardians of the Galaxy, has sold millions and millions of CDs. In fact, my checks for use of various various tracks of mine on soundtracks of films uh, are quite substantial. Definitely five-figure sums arrive every few months. The soundtrack of this is available if you want to buy it on iTunes, by the way. And this thud, particular thud, track thud, is a new thud, one I've thud, made called thud, 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 thud by thud, DJ thud, EU thud, featuring thud, BJ Arno. You may be wondering why I was kept in a cell in Woking Police Station for 36 hours. The excuse by the police was they were having to search my home and it was taking them days because of course I've lived in my home for 50 years and also it's got all my mother's, my dearly departed mother's stuff in crates all over the house so it was going to take ages for them to go through absolutely everything. Mind you of course I pretty quickly 
sus that that wasn't why they were keeping me incommunicado in a prison cell for 36 hours. I know how the police work. <laughs> the police, who I call CBS, not CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, but CBS, cunning but stupid. And the cunning but stupid Surrey police reckon, quite rightly actually, that without me being available to put my other side of the story to Great Britain's media, they would get their story carried as they wanted it told, i.e. this was all connected with the Walton Hot Disco, which it wasn't, and the papers would carry that without question. They wouldn't carry my side of the story because I wasn't around to give it. I was locked in a prison cell for 36 unnecessary hours. And now let's go back in time, way, way back in time, 60 years ago, to a little church hall in Walton-on-Thames called the Playhouse. Jonathan, I have to tell you how much I really enjoyed Entertainment USA. I wanna go back there again. I wanna go back there again. Sixty years ago, my friend Dennis Corday, born in Bermuda and over here to edit a movie but then banned by the union, had decided to open the very first disco in the world where pop music could be played for teenagers to dance to and meet people with no alcohol available, just coke and coffee. It was a huge success, inspiring many imitators. And by the time I entered the music business in the 60s, a brilliant place to test out new sounds and artists. Stars like Billy Fury came here all the time to the delight of the crowds of teenagers. Dennis lived just up the road from the playhouse. Now, fast forward again to 2000, 2001, 2002. As a dear friend, he insisted on standing up for me during and after my trials, strongly against my advice, but he gave several TV and press interviews defending me and speaking the truth. Over a year or so after my wrongful conviction and correct acquittal at a second trial, unreported in the media, my appeal was due to be heard. The ghastly Surrey police resurrected a later false claim, saying I'd taken TV celebrity Matthew Kelly to an orgy in order to kill my appeal chances. I've never been to an orgy, never wanted to, and have never met Matthew Kelly, whose life was turned upside down by arrest and publicity. All simply Surrey police using the media and another innocent victim of the false allegations industry to corrupt justice. Inspector Brian Marjoram managed to get an all expenses paid trip to Sri Lanka out of it. The media, knowing Dennis was my friend, alighted on him like a flock of vultures. He said, I said, why have we got five newspapers here and at least three editors? He said, because there's a rumour going around in the media that you're willing to talk and say you saw these famous people at these parties where boys were. And we don't know if it's a rumour or not, but it, if it's not, we want to take advantage of it, and you could be well off by the time we finish. Dennis was offered up to £4,000 for my letters from prison. These letters were perfectly harmless, just talked about life in general, but we realised subsequently that if they'd bought those letters, they would have printed an excerpt from them and then actually claimed they said things that they didn't say at all. That was why they were worth so much money, which in today's currency is probably about thirty to forty thousand pounds. The editor came in a taxi all the way from London, and he took over in a way 
they were all arguing about, um, you know, if I should uh, talk to this paper or that paper. They all gave me reasons. I can't remember now what, why I should go with one paper, not the other. And the editor of The Sun, who was quite cool, kept saying, but they can't give you as much as we can. And the young reporter took me into the kitchen, said, can I have a word with you? And he said, my editor, that's the editor of The Sun, has whispered in my ear that whatever they offer, he will double it. So don't say yes to anybody. But all of a sudden, Dennis realised why all these newspapers were there. They weren't really interested in me. They weren't really even interested in Matthew Kelly, who by then had been completely exonerated and everybody knew he hadn't been taken by me to any parties anywhere. They were interested in somebody else, a friend of mine who had been my bail bond in 2000 editor of the sun and i'm sure the other newspapers you'll have to forgive me i can't name them because i can't remember so far back but the editor of the sun was adamant that i had been to parties where boys were and a lot of famous people and he was also very adamant which, which got me because he seemed to be possessed by it he kept saying i know that fucking simon Carl is gay, he's not going to get away with it, I'm going to get him. I can't stand people that are gay that say they're not. And I just know without you telling me he was at those parties. But I have to get your word that he was to verify it. You may ask, why am I going on about this? Or, or why is Dennis going on about this? I'll tell you. Because it's a dreadful triumvirate finding a, a lie and actually creating a lie that can make people a lot of money and a lot of profits. The police benefit from this lie. The media benefits enormously from this lie. They get a great story. And the judiciary benefits from this lie because they get a conviction and they look like they're being tough on people. It's actually a terribly dangerous situation. So I went in the bedroom and I lit a cigarette and I start thinking, look, Dennis, you don't know Simon Cowell and all the other people they want you to name. They want a lot of famous people to have been at those parties. You can tell the way they're talking. Well, it, it, I, I heard, I, I forgot to say this, but I heard somebody in the kitchen say, a hundred thousand pound then and I had that in my mind I, I it was probably the sum but I can't remember this guy said to another guy it's a hundred thousand and I think he was trying to put the other paper off you see that's that's my imagination but anyhow I sat on the bed having a cigarette and I said you don't know these people Dennis you've you've never had much money in your life a hundred thousand pound, you could go back to Bermuda and live your final days. Take it. You won't destroy them. They can't prove it. Say they were at the parties and make it definite and take the money. Well, as soon as I said take the money to myself, the most strangest feeling went from my body, from my feet, to my heart, to my brain. And it was like somebody saying, as if it was an angel, <laughs> if you like, saying, that's not your character, you can't do that. You'll have such a guilty conscience, you'll never enjoy the money. And something was speaking to me like that. That's all I can say. Because the whole thing was strange anyhow. So you have to understand, I was in a strange world that day with five newspapers and offering money. And everything was strange, even that. And I said to myself right away, no way, no way. I don't care if they can prove it or not. I'm not taking the money. So Dennis left his bedroom, went into his main room and told everybody there he was not going to accept their money and could they please get out. 
I said, you know what? I can understand now why people have lied to you when you've given them a hundred thousand pound. I've seen it in, in there where you paid money and you say they're not lying, but I can see how easy it is to lie. I dislike you in a way, and I meant this, and you'll understand this in a psychological way, I dislike you in a way because you almost turned me into a monster, which I would have regretted for the rest of my life if I hadn't come to my senses. And I said, I resent that in, in you because you made me feel like that. And you almost won. I said, but you didn't. So I can understand other people that didn't worry about as much as I do, that were desperate for money, probably went to you in the first place because they wanted money, how they would accept a hundred thousand pound to lie about a celebrity. This became an incredible revelation to Dennis Corday, just how corrupt and bent and crooked the media could be. He already knew the police behaved like that, and now he knew that not only did the law courts also behave like that, but mainly so did the media. And, and they all left. And not one of them said goodbye. And that's another thing that irritated me. Oh, thank you, Mr. Corday. They all left in an irritable mood. Now, why the other food? This is what I thought of, too. Why the other four papers left in an irritable mood? They already knew that the sun was going to beat them if I had talked. You know, I should have thought they got used to the idea. Maybe they thought they could all put up a certain amount each. I don't know what happened. But they were all irritable and all left, and they never phoned me again. I think Dennis was most irritated by the allegations completely false about Simon Cowell. I, I want to apologise for bringing his name up, but I have to because you know, I didn't see, see him at any parties, ever. You've never met him? I, I never met, uh, uh, what's the other Matthew guy? Kelly. I never met Matthew Kelly. I met Tam Payton twice. I've already said that before. Uh, I want to apologise to him that he seemed to be in the conversation all the time. But, and I, but I want Simon to know I'm so pleased that I didn't accept the money to lie about him. Because since then I've got to know him on television and I like him a lot. So Simon, if you ever watch this, I want you to know I'm really glad because I got to really like... Oh, it's not filming. No, it's just filming still. Okay. Uh, I want you to know that I've got to know you since, because I didn't know you before, uh, watching the programs with you in them, and I got to like you a lot now. So I'm really pleased I didn't lie about you. Dennis Corday, a genuinely good, decent and honest man, filmed a couple of years ago. More about Dennis in a moment. So, why did all this happen, I can hear you pondering. Why should Jonathan King, already discredited 16 years ago when he was arrested in November 2000, wrongly convicted in 2001, then correctly acquitted in 2001 in a second trial, and as a result sentenced for the first trial verdict as a sample for all claims of historical sex abuse, be suddenly arrested again in 2015 over false allegations about 1977. Well, I have a suspicion, no more than that, that my article published in August in the Spectator magazine saying that I thought former Prime Minister Sir Edward Heath was non-sexual provoked those shadowy figures behind the scenes to say, oops, we don't want this man heard by a wider audience, shut him up. Certainly, the editor of The Spectator, Fraser Nelson, got a huge amount of complaints for carrying my harmless little article, not for what it said, but outraged that I should be published at all. The words of a vile pervert. Shocking! 
There had been very little mainstream media attention since my release from prison in 2005, apart from the sea of coverage at that time. Although my appearance in front of Lord Justice Brian Leveson suggested his panel should examine the way police use media to obtain miscarriages of justice, deserved examination, caused quite some fuss in the corridors of power. Still, whether or not Shut Him Up played a part in the establishment, I was arrested on September the 9th, 2015, the day after returning from Europe in my car, unpacking the contents into my house with the help of James, my assistant, and spending a night sleeping deeply before being rudely awakened at crack of dawn, followed by the expected loads of publicity. As required by Surrey Police, publicity provokes further allegations after all. The Mail, the best but also the nastiest paper in Great Britain, sat outside my house for days afterwards and finally managed to get a snap which ran as a huge news story that I dressed strangely. Stop it. I can hear you. I know what you're thinking. You're bored to tears with all this rubbish about things that happened years ago. It doesn't matter, you're thinking. Well, I really do think it does matter. It uh, actually exemplifies the incredible changes that have gone on over the past few years. This has been a very strange decade, and actually it's been the media that's been a major part of it. Not just traditional media, but social media, things like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and so on. And the world has become very, very strange. When a dyed blonde-haired self-publicist who gets accused of doing naughty things with young ladies can become President of the United States, oops, sorry, I was wrong about that, uh, can actually die and then get uh, accused of being the worst paedophile of all time when in fact he was just another rather eccentric disc jockey years ago, you know that the world is going down a very, very weird path. I have to tell you, meantime, I've been doing lots of other stuff like writing books, novels, biographies, and even writing songs and making music. For example, I've tried to put in the Eurovision Song Contest entry for France, which had to be written mainly in French. I composed it with a friend of mine who speaks better French than I do and uh, put it forwards, but it was not accepted. I still think it was very good. Je t'aime beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup. You were a Facebook friend until we came to me. You fell in love with me and swept me off my feet. Je t'aime beaucoup. Je 
thought that was rather good and very catchy and could have won Eurovision for France but they didn't accept it. What's a girl to do? Meantime I was making other tracks and I was also writing books. I was being very busy but what I wasn't expecting on September the 9th 2015 was to have my front door broken in after about two seconds of knocking and for me to be dragged out of bed naked, arrested, and rushed down to Woking Police Station in Surrey. Never expect the Spanish Inquisition. This Christmas tree was designed by Pierre Balma and was first erected here in the hotel in 1975. I was actually here when it was put up. If you wanted to, you could call it a load of old balls, but way back then, it was a load of new balls. Two other people were arrested on the 9th of September 2015, Operation Ravine, looking at the Walton Hop Disco. One of them was Rob Randall, who had been a disc jockey and remained a close friend of Dennis Corday's and a friend of mine as well. Uh, Rob, when I spoke to him, told me that the two men he was accused of having abused way back in the 60s and 70s, he had no idea who they were, didn't recognise their names, and like me on the advice of his solicitor, since he didn't know who they were, I think he made no comment interviews. He was a really decent, nice human being. Uh, he said to me when I went and saw him after all this, I can't believe this is happening. I've never done any of these things I'm being accused of. It is absolutely horrendous. How can I prove my innocence? And indeed, you shouldn't have to prove your innocence when uh, claims are made against you, unless there is very serious evidence that you did commit those crimes. Rob says he didn't know these two men, had never committed any crimes like that, and how could he defend himself? How could you prove you didn't do something 40 or 50 years ago? He was very, very depressed by this. The stress was incredible. He'd been through it slightly before, on a much lesser basis, 15 years ago, during the whole Operation Arundel thing that I suffered underneath. But he, of course, was not quite as strong as I was in coping with all this. Also, he didn't have the horrendous publicity that I had. Bob was still very, very distressed, and I said to him, look, I didn't think he need worry too much because there hadn't been a huge amount of publicity about his arrest, but I did warn him that publicity does provoke claims, be they false or true, and there would be claims made against him. Rob's 
reaction when I said that to him was absolute horror. I couldn't cope with any further allegations, he said. I don't know how to defend myself. This is just so stressful, as many other people have found out over recent years. Anyway, subsequently, some time later on, he was told that when he went in to answer bail uh, in, I think, June or July 2016, there had been four further allegations made against him and he was going to have to answer questions about them. I was by then abroad, so I wasn't able to speak to him, but I know he took it very badly. Later that day, Rob Randall took his own life. Another death attributed to Surrey Police and Operation Ravine. And you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction? Rob didn't even want to know the names of his four new false accusers. He said, what's the point? These days you get found guilty if somebody accuses you of something, whether you've met them in a million years or not. And that's the frightening thing about the state of British justice these days. It really doesn't matter if the truth is involved at all. But somehow even worse than what happened to Rob was what happened to Dennis Corday. The two allegations against him uh, were about two people he'd known for years and who were very close friends of his, Liam, who he'd sort of brought up as a grandfather from a tiny age, and Lawrence, who he'd known for absolute years. But the frightening thing was, neither of those two had made any allegations against him. The allegations had technically been made by an anonymous tip-off. It's good news week. Someone's dropped a bomb somewhere contaminating atmosphere and blackening the sky. It's good news week. Someone's found a way to give the rotten dead the will to live for one and never die. Both Liam and Lawrence had a uh, visit from the police at exactly the same time as Dennis was arrested. The police demanded that they make a statement accusing Dennis. Both Liam and Lawrence refused to do so, said there was no truth in it whatsoever, he was a dear friend of theirs, and would the police please piss off? Which the police eventually did, but it didn't stop them still arresting Dennis and accusing him and interviewing him at great length. When he got home, there were these uh, panicking phone calls on his answering machine from both Liam and Lawrence saying, what the hell is going on? Dennis's only conditions of bail was that he could not contact in any way either Liam and Lawrence. But after a few weeks, his solicitor got onto the police and said, this is absolutely ridiculous. Both these men are saying they have made no complaint. So sorry, police kindly in the generosity of their souls decided to lift his bail and allow him to have contact with both Liam and Lawrence. Who's won that race? What's the weather like today? Have you heard the news? What did it say? Who's won that race? What's the weather like today? I drove him over to Lawrence's house. Lawrence, at about the age of 20, had suffered a terrible motorcycle accident and was basically paraplegic from the neck down. He could move to a certain degree, but couldn't really do very much movement. When we got there, I had a quiet chat with Lawrence on his own, and Lawrence said to me, Jonathan, they were absolutely awful. What happened to him had been really, really stressful. The police had arrived and had bullied him and had accused uh, Dennis of doing these dreadful things which were completely untrue. After the police left, when Lawrence couldn't contact Dennis, he was rushed to hospital suffering from terrible stress pains. His um, insides were not that good anyway, he had some kinds of ulcers. Lawrence was eventually allowed home by the hospital after a couple of weeks in hospital, which was when Dennis and I went to visit him. But he was still very, very upset and it had obviously affected him very badly. 
Lawrence's recovery from the motorcycle accident had been nothing short of miraculous. He'd spent a lot of time in Stoke Mandeville, where, strangely enough, Jimmy Savile had been one of the many people who visited him, and Lawrence said he was absolutely brilliant and a superb guy. Anyway, Lawrence had managed to cope very well, being almost paralysed and unable to move, and was living in sheltered housing. He was about 56 when this sudden invasion of the police arrived. But uh, when Dennis and I saw him, he said he really wasn't feeling great. He couldn't keep any food down. He kept bring, bringing it back up again. And I was quite worried about him. Dennis seemed reasonably uh, happy because he said Lawrence had dealt with it all so well. But then, a couple of weeks later, out of the blue, Lawrence died. I reckon another death directly attributed to Surrey Police. And you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction? I do hope I'm not boring you. Sometimes this feels a bit like a lecture and it's meant to be entertainment. But the point I'm trying to make is we're in a very dangerous situation when the police and the law and the judiciary in a democratic society crosses the line. And I think the police have crossed the line when instead of investigating crimes, they subtly, and possibly even without realising it, begin to provoke crimes. I think a lot of police involved in investigations into historical sexual abuse have actually been conspiring to pervert the course of justice. And in this case, I think almost every time that is what's been going on. I've been busy doing a lot of other things, mind you. I'm not just totally obsessed by the false allegations industry which has been exploding. I've been writing books, my own autobiography for example. I've been making movies such as Me Me Me, the movie. I've been uh, putting out compilation CDs, our UK Records Greatest Hits CD, which I've got to tell you is absolutely fabulous. All of these are freely available through Amazon although the word freely might be dodging it slightly. But I've got to admit, I am fairly concentrating, especially at the moment, on trying to prove that the false allegations industry exists and is very dangerous, full of liars or fantasists, uh, crooked or greedy lawyers, bent or incompetent police officers, and a judiciary that falls for all of these things and is essentially bored. And I've been trying to write that evasive Eurovision Song Contest winner. I thought I'd really crack it with this one. Four cute girls who managed to lose their smartphones, the ultimate disaster in modern life.
sounds like a Eurovision winner. Still, what do I know? One of the things I love about Morocco is every single town is completely different. It could be in a different country. Fez, Meknes, Tangier, Casablanca, Marrakesh, Agadir, Eswera, wherever you go, it's different. I was constantly being rebailed. This went on for over a year. The reason was, unlike 16 years before, the publicity had failed to provoke fresh allegations. I think all those had been used up then, and the false allegations industry had moved on with bigger fish to fry. There was far less publicity this time around. Minor celebrities were being arrested and often even convicted on a weekly basis. Abuse fatigue had set in. So the team were having to work on reviving old allegations, abandoned, deserted or ignored first time around, persuading them to revive their stories and improve them. I was getting calls from friends, acquaintances and even total strangers complaining that they had received unsolicited contact from people claiming to be investigating officers trying to get them to make false allegations against me. Here in Tangier you can still see the cannons pointing across the Mediterranean, a sort of African version of Afrexit. Brexit. They want nothing to do with Europe. The cannons are still here, and so is our Brexit. It's a bit windy here in Tangier at the moment. It always is in August. The wind blows in the south of France. They call it the Mistral. But that's the way things go. It's all part of the weather. And whether or not these people were actually part of Surrey Police remains a mystery. They took time to say they were not. They turned out to be retired transport police or family liaison officers or traffic wardens hired back at great expense to the taxpayer and as a result not quite obeying police rules. One top journalist from one of Britain's greatest national papers had a call and contacted me in high dudgeon. Friends were furious, angry that police could behave this way. Top social media names, long-term employees of mine, business contacts. Many wanted to make an official complaint about this trawling, fishing or whatever it was called. I'm sorry to go on about this, but I really do feel it very, very strongly. The entire world, society, is crumbling because of things like this. It's fair enough for police to try to solve crimes and prosecute criminals, but they cross the line when they actually try to provoke false allegations or assist liars or the mistaken or the troubled and confused by providing them with details that can be claimed later as evidence. That is when police become criminals, assisted by loopholes in the law allowing them to disguise breaking the law as being helpful, kind and concerned. How would you describe his car? Was it a Rolls Royce? Would you say he gave you any money, such as a £20 note? Did this experience damage you and ruin your future life? What colour was his front door? Could it have been blue? This is when, blurring the lines, crooked policing becomes conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Does anybody know? Does anybody care? Well, they know now. Perhaps you will now care. Please don't get the impression that I'm condemning police. I don't think intentionally they tried to destroy people, but I think 
firstly they're very incompetent and secondly they don't think and thirdly everybody is so superficial these days Operation Ravine basically killed Lawrence Pollinger. He was the first death to come out of it. Then Rob Randall. He was the second death to come out of it. And thirdly, Dennis Corday, who was really quite fit and well and healthy as an 86-year-old, declined as an 87-year-old and actually had to go into a care home. The difference between him, uh, before Surrey Police started Operation Ravine and afterwards, was absolutely horrendous. Now, of course, politicians keep saying, our thoughts are with friends and family. Their thoughts are not with friends and family. Their thoughts are with their career or what they're having for dinner tonight. They're so superficial, but so is everybody else. The police were very sweet to Dennis, saying how they felt terrible about Lawrence Pollinger dying and how badly they felt about Rob Randall killing himself. But the actual reality is they don't care. They don't give a shit one way or the other. Police, as most people, including politicians, simply do their job, get on with their life and allow such things as deep emotion to pass them by. At last, after over a year on bail, I was called back, this time to answer questions about eight further allegations against me, cobbled together and coincidentally exactly the same amount that Cliff Richard had made against him. These eight false allegations were clearly based on complaints that had been made 16 years ago and had been completely rejected and thrown out by the police at that time and that now had been revived and tried to make stick. Meanwhile, I wrote another Eurovision Song Contest entry rejected by all the countries I sent it to. I'm over you. You are a beautiful boy from a beautiful land You look so handsome walking on the sand You came up to me and you held my hand It seems so bizarre but I understand In the summer sun by the summer sea For too long weeks it was just you and me You were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you You were always I'm glad that I'm over you You had to go home and I had to stay But you swore that it wasn't going to be that way You call me and speak to me every day And we talk for hours with nothing to say But time goes by and memories fade Didn't feel forgotten, didn't feel betrayed You were always going to break my heart
I'm over you. I'd have thought that was a Eurovision Song Contest winner too, but it wasn't. I'm constantly trying to persuade Morocco to re-enter the Eurovision Song Contest. It's been it once or twice. You think to yourself, Morocco, Eurovision? Well, Australia's in Eurovision, Israel's in Eurovision, Russia is in Eurovision, why not? Here in Morocco, there have been vineyards since long before they grew a grape in France. In Volubilis, which is one of the key and oldest cities in Morocco, they make some fantastic wine, and I'm about to drink some. And this is my lunch. Homemade hot dog buns with ham and avocado and salad cream inside. A large glass of volubilis white wine, or rather grey wine. And some fruit. Bananas, dates, apples, pears, and oranges picked straight from the tree outside. And who or what is a victim? Well, a victim, of course, can be one of many things. A girl could be a victim of a holiday romance when she was promised something that was never delivered. I am a victim of false allegations industry. There are victims of genuine abuse, historical and recent. And also victims come in all shapes and sizes. And a lot of people find being a victim a very attractive proposition. Not only can it make you a great deal of money, but it can get you a lot of attention and sympathy and people caring for you and looking after you. I think the worst kind of victim is somebody who is persuaded or cajoled by corrupt, bent, unintentional a lot of the time police officers who encourage them to lie or to exaggerate or to increase and inflate stories in order to get a high profile conviction or any conviction at all. You were a beautiful boy from a beautiful land. You looked so handsome walking on the sand You came up to me and you held my hand It seemed so bizarre but I'd understand In the summer sun by the summer sea For two long weeks it was just you and me You were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you You were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you You had to go home and I had to stay But you swore that it wasn't gonna be that way You'd call me and speak to me every day And we'd talk for hours with nothing to say But time goes by and memories fade Didn't feel forgotten, didn't feel betrayed You were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you You were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you An appalling example of a victim of police collusion was the poor girl who only went to the police because she lost her handbag and found herself being persuaded to give evidence against innocent Ched Evans of rape. A summer romance is a wonderful thing But a broken heart has a permanent sting I forgot how to love, I forgot how to sing And I lost all the presents you used to bring It's always the same with heroes They rapidly turn into zeros You were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you you were always going to break my heart I'm glad that I'm over you Ched Evans had his football career ruined by the false allegations, the prosecution, the conviction and ultimately his acquittal. But his life was still wrecked. It seems bizarre that so many of these witch hunts, mostly coming from the false allegations industry, seem to cover areas of people trying to help people. We, 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 I was in a band with two friends of mine, Charlie McDonnell and Tom Milton, and it, it was sort of his idea. It was like the whole work was ours, but it was the sort of spark came from him of saying, oh, why don't you try this? 
Um, and that happened several times. I had a hit song in the charts because Jonathan just saw this opportunity and said, why don't you give this a go, try and get into the charts. I put all the work in and did it all myself, but it's just that sort of guidance, and that's just his influence in my life. He's just been very helpful in just sort of steering me in the right direction and being a lovely person. I wrote a book uh, a couple of years later. I was sort of like the first YouTube person to write a book and kicked all that off, and he's, there's a whole bit in there about him and how he's just a lovely human being, and the book's dedicated to him on the front page. Accusations I've read about and seen are basically a load of old bollocks. Vicars and priests, doctors, social workers, foster parents, care homes, and even these days, different assorted sports. It has become a ludicrous situation. And now let's go back in time, way, way back in time, back to around the First World War, a hundred years ago, perhaps even before that, the Victorian era, when all kinds of morals were very much black and white, and people hid things, hypocrisy ruled. Times changed over the 30s, 40s, 50s, and finally in the 60s, we broke through the barrier of British hypocrisy, and people became free. They became free to take drugs if they wanted to. I never did. They became free even to have sex with one another, even if they happened to be horror of horrors of the same gender. People were liberated. If they fell in love, it was a good thing. It was something generally approved of. But then, times changed again. The Puritans returned. And slowly but surely, a horrific, horrendous, horrible morality started to emerge. The you-will-be-believed philosophy emerged. And that was essentially the philosophy that if somebody said something happened, it happened. Michael Howard, Michael Howard of Pippil fame, became Home Secretary in the 1990s and changed the law so that one person's evidence was acceptable in court. If one person said this happened, you didn't need any corroboration. It happened, and the person who they claimed it happened by was sent to prison for a very, very long time. However, times changed again. The head of the Metropolitan Police Force in London, the Chief Commissioner, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, decided, or rather was pushed, that this was ludicrous what was going on. And he commissioned a retired top judge and Queen's Counsel, Sir Richard Henriquez, to come up with a report on Operation Midland essentially the police operation that had taken seriously claims about former Prime Minister Sir Edward Heath and various other notable people and had actually ruined their lives. Sir Richard Henry Kez, retired judge, came up with an absolutely damning report. He said, Dear Bernard, with my report. It is with much regret that I must find such serious failings in the conduct of both Operation Midland and Operation Vincente. The principal cause of the mistakes in Operation Midland was the decision to search the several premises, thereby risking the names of the householders being publicised. I believe it was essential to investigate the allegations including, as they did, three child murders. 
But the decision to search those premises was a grave error of judgment when the several inconsistencies in Nick's interviews are carefully analysed as they should have been prior to the searches. It is highly significant that two analyses of Nick's inconsistencies were carried out after the searches had taken place, but none before. It is also most regrettable that the district judge who granted the search warrants was informed that Nick had been consistent. I have enumerated his many inconsistencies in my conclusions. I have concluded that this investigation could have been carried out speedily and without those named by Nick learning of it. Operation Vincenti also involved a grave error of judgment. I believe that a contributory factor in Operation Midland's errors was the nationwide requirement that victims, in inverted commas, must be believed. It is significant that on the 20th of May 2015, some six months into the investigation, the Gold Group Minute contained these words. The group acknowledged that NPS policy was that victims must be believed. I am encouraged by your letter of the 22nd of February 2016 to, to, some, to Sir Tom Windsor on the subject. It appears that we have reached the same conclusion on the subject quite independently. I applaud the many initiatives to make it easier for those sexually abused to make contact with police. Much work must be done to improve the police relationship with suspects. I am aware of the concern expressed towards this end by A.C. Gallon in her meetings with the Select Committee. It cannot be right that suspects, their names having been publicised, are left for many months with no idea when a decision might be made. I have observed the crushing effect that a prolonged investigation can have on innocent suspects and their families. I am alarmed by views expressed that false complaints are infinitesimally low. I am concerned at the amount of publicity that is given to the arrest, search, bail and rebail of suspects when MPS policy is that anonymity should remain until charge. The policy of DMC in supplying the age and location of suspects frequently give the media the confidence to publish the names and allegations that innocent suspects have faced. There exists at present an unjustifiable imbalance between the scrutiny of complainants and suspects, which was highlighted in Operation Midland. If an investigation is to be without fear or favour, some degree of parity of treatment must be sought. Some of this imbalance is unavoidable. Those making complaints must, however, realise that if their complaint is to be investigated, their mobile phones and computers will have to be scrutinised. That's not Sir Richard Henrique's retired judge and QC. In the picture I have shown you, it's me when I was pretending to be a judge in an earlier movie, Vile Pervert the Musical. But I think the point I've made is valid.
Seriously, Sir Richard Henry Kerr's report was absolutely extraordinary. A fair, unbiased observer looked at the way police had been behaving for years and found serious grave faults. First, devastating consequences of publicity coming from media provoked by police tip-offs and terrible flaws in obtaining search warrants in order to get publicity, ranging from accidental errors to deliberately misleading and lying to magistrates and judges. Five top officers have been suspended from duty as their behaviour is examined. Second, outrageous lies about the quantity of false allegations. The majority of all claims are at very least exaggerated and at worst totally manufactured for reasons of greed or delusion or desire for attention. Third, the appalling assumption that claimants are victims. They are not victims. Fourth, the ignoring by police and judiciary of the presumption of innocence, a vital ingredient for fair trials. And fifth, police failing to examine the background and motives of accusers and concentrating on trying to prove their claims true, and sometimes even assisting false accusers and intentionally or accidentally conspiring to pervert the course of justice. I strongly urge you to read the Henry Kent report in full. It is devastating. The truth has finally awoken. This has been an absolutely marvellous moment against the false allegations industry. Hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent victims of it may now be released from prison or not imprisoned in the first place. Years ago they danced as though tomorrow they could all be dead. I'm afraid in 2017, we are in a similar situation. One of the things I did very early in my career, I was only in my 20s, I'd just left Charterhouse School, but I came back here and a young lad rushed up to me with a tape of this band who had been at the school, who were still at the school, it was the local school band, they were only teenagers, um, gave me a cassette, said they hadn't got a name. Uh, I played the cassette in my car on the way back to town and thought the singer was absolutely fantastic. When I got to London, I called their house, which was Duckites, technically known as Girdlestonites, here in Charterhouse. I asked for the lad who was the singer, whose name was Peter Gabriel, and I decided to record them, gave them the name Genesis. That was 50 years ago. Pick me up, put me down, push me in, turn me round, switch me on, let me go. A mind of my own in hiding far from the city of night and the factories of truth. I stand upon the mountain, million miles from my home, and the faces of fear. I have freedom to think in hiding I may take off my clothes that I wear on my face I float upon a river A million miles from the plains That appears in the clouds I am lost in the beauty in hiding Pick me up, put me down Push me in, turn me round Switch me on, 
I remember my first experience of death was when my father died, but I was only eight or nine or ten, so it didn't really mean very much. And my third experience of death was when dear Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, died in the late 1960s. But my second experience of death was here at Charterhouse School, when a young lad who was in the same house as me and about the same age as me was on his bicycle down in Godalming, the local uh, town, and he was run into by a car and killed. His name was Hutchison, and I've never forgotten it. The school has plaques in one of the cloisters in the music block, commemorating the pupils and teachers who died, be it in accidents or just normal mortality or during wars. And in the war against decency, when the forces of the evil empire are represented by so many establishment supporters of the false allegations industry, there has been another death. No, fortunately not me, yet I hasten to add, who knows what the future will bring and not some of those we've mentioned before, Millie Dowler and the equally distressing Amélie de la Grange or Marsha MacDonald, nor poor young Breck Bednar, nor the Deep Cut Murders, nor wonderful Lynn Bryant, representing wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, who managed to do the job our police should be doing and found solid evidence proving husbands or friends were totally, absolutely innocent and got their release from prison on appeal, but then passed away stressed to death. Death. No, none of them. The latest to die was my friend Dennis Corday, aged 87, stressed beyond belief by the vile operation Ravine, declining in months, losing weight, becoming depressed, and after losing the will to live, finally and eventually losing his life. I was very sad when Dennis died, a lovely, honourable, decent man. But I was even sadder watching his decline thanks to the diabolical Operation Ravine. He hated seeing his life's work vandalised and distorted. The effect that these investigations have cannot be overstated. There are now so many innocent men and women who face this, ranging from lies that eventually get dropped, to those sent to the CPS and no further action decided, to those acquitted after expensive court cases, to those, like myself, wrongly convicted and suffering a miscarriage of justice. The simple hours of incredibly offensive questions by polite police is really stressful. You can see it in many faces, the effects of stress. Many end up dead, so depressed and frightened and upset by totally false allegations. Lawrence Pollinger died, questioned about abuse that never happened an innocent man named by some anonymous troll as a victim, not even a perpetrator. Imagine the stress provoked by armed cops arriving and grilling you about a totally innocent old friend. Robert Randall died, falsely accused. Dennis Corday died, 
falsely accused. Me? Well, it seems the lies and fantasies that started this latest drama have been rejected. No surprise to me, I'd never even met the man, described here by police. I can't tell you the name of the two false accusers. They have anonymity for life. Why on earth do they have anonymity for life? So I've blacked out the name here, but it goes on to read. XX has had a lot of psychiatric treatment over the years. He suffers with hallucinations, depression, anxiety and low self-esteem. He had a troubled childhood and his adoptive mother reported that he was a liar and a thief at this time. That's from the official police application for a search warrant on the very first day before my house was broken into. Even then they had to disclose to the magistrate that the person who was accusing me was a known liar. I believe he'd made several false allegations against other people in the past few years. So, in 2017 I'm given this. I read this as it looks. Date the 9th of the 9th, 2015, 07.30. Custody record number CR451-501-1560. Dear Mr King, I refer to the offences for which you attended the police station. The police have decided that at this time you are to be released without charge in respect of the offences for which you recently attended. After consideration of the evidence and other information that is currently available, the decision was that, cross, there is insufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction. Yours faithfully, signed Custody Officer, Samantha White, P453537. And the paper is headed, Notification of Decision to Release Without Charge. The case manager, or chief investigating officer, went behind the desk and took over the computer to make sure there were no mistakes. But is this the end? I doubt it. There are still the subsequent bandwagons, as Gambo calls them, those provoked by media publicity or encouraged by people working for the police who contact elderly men and women and subtly suggest inflating past stories and reopening old imaginary wounds. Has the truth awakened? I don't know. I use that title more in hope than in faith. There are so many false accusers, so many innocent men and women in prison at this very moment. Why don't politicians or judges do something about it? Why don't they blow the whistle on this exploding area of crime? It's costing us taxpayers billions. Some may decide to pull the plug. Sadly, it may be too late. By then, they too may find themselves locked up. Yet another victim of the vile, false allegations industry. I have to say, Jonathan, or oh, to tell you again, how much I really enjoyed your series of Entertainment USA. It was really great. This is how the false allegations industry changed somebody in a few months. We can only hope that indeed the truth has awakened as far as the false allegations industry is concerned. I dedicate this documentary to all those still locked up in jail and their families and friends who cannot believe how unfair the British justice system has become. Walking round the corner